accept my apologies instantly when I wanted them to. I was so relieved that God had forgiven me and thought everyone else had to. But again, it was only to find that I had to wait for God's time, not mine. I work step 10 daily, searching for where and if I have wronged another human being by allowing my defects to overcome God's love. As a result of the 12 steps, I'm not able to hold on to old ways of deceiving myself. God allows me short periods of time for rationalization, He knows I'll die if I keep it. Step 11 is my way of getting out of myself. My time for prayer can be anytime, anywhere, because I now have a friend who listens whenever I pray. Meditation was hard at first, for I couldn't hear anything God was saying. As I work the program, I find that step 11 is when I work step 10, my listening to God to tell me when I've wronged another. Step 12 is my reason for being alive today. Being able to share what Narcotics Anonymous has done for me has allowed me to be alive. I now have an identity. I know what and who I am. Maybe somewhere, someone can relate to the pain my addiction caused me. If this is so, I've achieved my purpose for being alive and happy today. A little girl grows up 143. The program of Narcotics Anonymous gave me an identity. I can now hold my head high and tell anyone, Hi, my name is. I'm an addict. Before I came to the program and was asked, Who are you? I wouldn't answer because I had no idea what it really meant. I love the newly found me. I love getting to know me and getting to know other people who are like me. I now can feel emotions that were very deep within me for many years. The program has given me everything non-material. Happiness, I used to think, was what and how much I could buy. How little I knew of true happiness. I'm beginning to accept pain as growth. I know pain is essential. Through pain, God can break down many false personalities little by little in His own time. There is so much hope for me today. The program was a challenge that I needed desperately and was given to me as a gift. Each day I want more of what it has to offer. I want so much to learn, and I have a long way to go to reach the understanding I'm searching for. That's okay, at least I'm searching. To put into words what God and the program of Narcotics Anonymous have done for me has been difficult, there aren't words to express God's love. I hope that my story can reach someone, somewhere, but if it doesn't that's okay, because it has reached me. Thank you God, thank you Narcotics Anonymous for giving me me. 144 Narcotics Anonymous. It's okay to be clean. On one of my first drunks, at age 13, I made a fool of myself, God. Very sick, had trouble with my parents, and was kicked off the basketball team. In one night, I made plenty of reasons not to drink again, a preview of coming attraction. Two important reasons outweighed all the pain and trouble and kept me moving for years. First, was the attention I got at school. I was a celebrity for a short time. The other guys who drank welcomed me into their group and I felt the acceptance I craved. Second, and just as important, I liked the way the alcohol made me feel. I first smoked pot at age 14, and by the time I finished high school I was smoking several times a week and getting drunk most every weekend. I had experimented.
experimenting with drinking hard liquor, eating acid, mescaline, tea, mushrooms, and smoking different kinds of hash and pot. Being from a small town in Washington State, most drugs were hard to get, but there was always pot. The pot was easier for me to get than beer. I could buy the pot right at school, but I had to find someone of legal age to buy alcohol. I always partied with the same group of friends throughout my music. We shared our common interests in drinking and drugging, and I was afraid of meeting new people. I was always looking for happiness, fun, those good times. Whatever I did, the plans included drinking and smoking. I graduated from high school at age 17 and moved to a nearby, larger town with my school buddies. At last I was free of my parents' control, and had a place to party. For the next two and a half years I had my chance to live my life the way I wanted to do things my way. I got arrested for drunk driving at age 18 and spent the night in jail. I didn't consider then that I had a drinking or drug problem, I had a police problem. I just needed to let my friends drive. The best way to describe the last couple of years of my drug use is boring. I worked in a factory to pay my bills and to buy my pot and beer. Most of my spare time was spent sitting around the house with the television. 144. It's okay to be clean 145. On and the stereo turned up. I smoked every day and got drunk every weekend. Sometimes my friends and I would get in the car and drive out in the country to the same places we had gone when we first started moving. In the beginning, I had some fun times when I moved. In the end, it was a habit, the old fun just wasn't there very often. I always stayed with the people who partied the same way that I did. I didn't think that there was anything wrong with smoking a joint by myself before grocery shopping. I told myself that it would help me enjoy the experience. Of course it was perfectly alright to go to a drinking party and keep a case of beer in the car in case the peg went dry for 15 minutes, or it was alright to sit in one spot after eating acid and watch the numbers change on the digital clock. Didn't everyone? At age 20 I got arrested for drunk driving again and spent 3 days in jail. As I sobered up I realized that every time I got in trouble with the law I had been drinking. Of course, I didn't realize that smoking pot, or using some acid or speed once in a while would also get me into trouble. To get out of spending six months in jail and paying a big fine, I agreed to go to an alcoholism treatment center. I learned a lot there. Mainly that it is alright not to get high, that there are a lot of people who want to stay clean. I love to sit and listen to the other patients talk about their experiences. If I was as bad as these people, I would want to quit too, I thought. I learned that many of them started out just like me and ended up going through years of pain. I decided that I had gone down far enough and wanted to live clean. I also decided to treat pot and other drugs the same as alcohol. Getting high is getting high, no matter what I used to get there. I started to like myself. I opened up to people, let them get to know me, and they still like me. I got out of treatment with 30 days clean, but I hadn't fully accepted step 1. In 2 days, I smoked some pot. The sensations were familiar, but all the knowledge about addiction kept racing through my head. 
I realized that those counselors were right. I was an addict. I am powerless over that first smoke or drink. That was the last time I got high. Within a week, I had moved out on my own, away from old friends that I had depended on. I started going to meetings regularly and hanging around afterwards, meeting and talking to other members. I couldn't relate to the type or amount of drugs or behavior of most of the people. If I kept an open mind and listened for similarities instead of differences, I saw that we all shared some common feelings and a desire to stop using. I first got involved in service by 146 Narcotics Anonymous Helping set up and clean up the meeting room Later, I drove to the treatment centers and picked up patients to go to the meeting As time goes on, the third step becomes more real and important It wasn't too hard for me to believe that there is a higher power working in my life I just thought back to the car wrecks and blackouts when I could have gotten hurt or killed and wasn't. The things that I used to call luck or coincidence, I just call God's work. I use the word God because it's easy to spell. This God must really love me. He let me go through enough pain in using that I might learn a lesson from it, and have experience to share with others. He has guided me to this new, full rewarding life at a young age. If he has been this good to me so far, I figure I can trust him to take care of me each new day. I repeat step 3 in the morning and say thanks at night. When I was using, I would sit around talking and fantasizing about the things that I do today. Now I do them. I travel, meet new people, and am trusted with responsible positions. I enjoy hiking, biking, skiing, dancing and even dating. I have friends all over the United States now, and I feel closer to some of them than I ever did to my drinking buddies. It has been over three years since that relapse and I have had quite an adventure so far. I am not always happy or comfortable. I have had to reach out when I am scared or lonely. I have watched people that I like go back to their old ways. I have trouble with resentment, jealousy, and fear, among other feelings. I have found the 10th step very helpful, yet, I can't compare a few uncomfortable hours in recovery to the years of hangovers, remorse and blackouts while using. God is sure good to me. He has given me help in the NA principles and fellowship. When that old thinking comes back that, I'm not that bad, I just remember, how bad does it have to be before I want to get better? Today I live, thank you. Nowhere to turn 147. Nowhere to turn. My name is George and I am an addict and a member of Narcotics Anonymous. Today I am able to live clean and sober because of a fellowship of M.A.
my mother and grandparents. I was very sensitive and did not want others to see this, so I tried to hide it. I didn't like myself and always tried to be somebody other than the person I really was. At an early age, I would escape the reality of the here and now by fantasizing about the future. I thought somehow, if I could change me or find the right situation, that I could be happy someday. My need to control and dominate people only drove them away and I felt rejected. As I got older, I began to rebel at the society that I was blaming for my inability to be happy. At the same time, on a deeper level, I blamed myself. I started to get into trouble at home and at school for attention. Inside I was hurting and was very confused, but solutions were not at my disposal and I felt as though I must do whatever it took to be accepted by any crowd. I chose other kids who were getting into trouble and breaking all the rules. But even in that crowd, I felt different. Somehow I made it through high school and went on to college to please my family. I was not ready for the responsibility of college, and I wasn't motivated to learn. I felt out of place there and did poorly. At the end of my first semester I left school and got a job. I thought that hard work and low pay was what I needed to prove my manhood. This got old quickly. 147. 148 Narcotics Anonymous. I developed problems with people wherever I went and ran from one situation to another, blaming others for the problems that arose. I began to identify with the peace and love movement that was catching on around the country. I thought the musicians of this era really had the answer and part of that answer was to escape to enlightenment with drugs. I felt that I could be accepted by the long hair, because they talk of unconditional love and other spiritual principles. I started smoking pot, then came the first acid trip, then steam and barbiturate. My first experience with each drug was wonderful, and I wanted to keep doing it. I especially liked the speed and acid in those days and smoked pot to keep that stoned outlook on life. I thought that the drugs went along with the spiritual and mystical philosophy. One by one, I tried all of the drugs that I said I'd never do. My relationships with women were few, and none were successful. This drove me deeper into escaping with drugs. I felt fear and excitement with this new destructive way of life. Sometimes I had doubts and second thoughts about drugs, but when I was high I felt reassured and confident. I left the world behind in those moments until I came down confused and afraid. Fear of death became an obsession with me when I wasn't high. The effects of the speed and acid helped nurture the fear. I went back to school and continued to move more and more. At one point I cut my hair and started to drink a lot. I thought a change of lifestyle was the answer, but I still managed to find reasons to take pills to study and any other excuse I could find. I felt that life was empty and meaningless. I became more and more isolated at school and my consumption of speed increased until I was using it daily, and my health began to deteriorate. I became paranoid and fearful of people which made it harder to function. I would hang out with movers on the weekends back in my hometown. It seemed that their solution to the dilemma of moving was to move more until we reached the point of not caring at all. I finally quit trying to control my using and decided to quit fighting it. It 
if I was going to be a good team and self-destructive, I was going to do a good job of it. It seems that it was becoming more and more accepted that bloopers were losers and we might as well stay loaded completely. Take as much dope as you can, constantly, became my new philosophy for survival. The speed runs left me burned out. I had sores in my mouth. My skin was turning yellow and much of the time I couldn't go out at night because I couldn't focus my vision and I hallucinated. Nowhere to turn 149. I came home from school in the summer of 1971 totally wasted, it was then that I was introduced to heroin. Shooting morphine and heroin was becoming more and more a part of the local dope culture and I had a few friends who were well into it. I tried it and thought it was good for me because I could relax and eat and sleep. I learned to use a needle and by mid-summer I was shooting dope two or three times a day. Jail, doing time, and violence were the new topics of conversation, no more peace and love. Now it was conning, ripping people off and doing whatever was necessary to get narcotics. I did not like any of this new talk but the dope made it more and more acceptable. Finally, I got involved in breaking into houses and forging checks. I stole from my family, lied, sold my musical instruments for money to get drugs. At the end of the summer I was arrested for check forgery and put in jail where I went into withdrawal. It was a nightmare to realize how far down I had fallen and was going to have to answer to the law for my actions. My mother bailed me out and the local drug council sent me to a psychologist for therapy. The therapy did not work, because I was still using. So my lawyer suggested that I go to Lexington to the federal drug hospital. I stayed long enough to detox and came home with the idea that I would go to school and everything would be okay. I also thought one shot wouldn't hurt anything. Back into active using again, I sought help again at the local drug council because I knew they were sending people to a doctor who was writing prescriptions for methadone and barbiturates.